Thanks for tuning in to another Echo Range Models build video. Today we're going to be building Hobbyboss's 148 scale Antonov AN2 Colt. There's just something about the utilitarian agricultural look of these things that I just love. The fact that they remain fully controllable at 30 miles an hour just blows my mind. So I won't be going too in depth into the construction process. The kit goes together generally really well, as with most Hobbyboss kits. I have something a little different from the norm in store for this particular model. Uh, a number of ex-crop dusting aircraft were pressed into service by the newly formed Croatian Air Force during the 1991 to 1995 War of Independence, uh, including a few that were used as rudimentary bombers, uh, but I will touch on that a little more later. I plan on fitting an Eddard pre-coloured photo etch set to this model, so a few parts in the cockpit were shaved down in preparation. For the actual instrument panel, rather than try to sand the detail away, I simply installed it back to front. The interior was painted with my usual mottle technique over a black base, just to give a bit of depth to the final finish before any further weathering. A piece of old packing sponge from an Eddard aftermarket set was used to apply some Vallejo Mecha chipping colour in a random pattern to most of the interior surfaces. This is something you can do with a fine brush but I just find it's easier and quicker to do with a sponge instead. A few interior details were picked out using Mission Models Black 
I find these paints are really nice to brush paint as they have a nice dense pigment to them. I also picked out the little fire extinguisher inside the cabin with some Vallejo RLM 23 Red. At this point the seat cushions were installed along with the mercifully simple seat belts from the Eddard set. All of the interior parts were given a wash using my own totally scientifically measured mix of black and sepia washes from the Army Painter along with Johnson's clear floor polish. This is liberally applied to everything, uh, just taking care to remove any bubbles that might appear. Next, a coat of gloss varnish seals everything in. Sh shielmush? A coat of gloss varnish seals everything in and helps get rid of any undesired brush marks left behind from the wash, giving it all a nice even finish. Once the glosses touch dry, you can go straight in with a matte coat. I've tried a lot of matte varnishes on the market, and Mr. Colour's Super Smooth Clear is by far my favourite at the moment. Mixed with Mr. Leveling Thinner, it gives a beautiful flat surface. I touched earlier on building this aircraft as a bomber. Now, the bombs themselves were actually old boilers, fuel and gas canisters filled with explosives and metal with fuses attached to the top, uh, as can be seen in this film taken in the early 90s. These were literally just pushed out of the rear door. Mm -hmm. 
Now this is something I at least partially wanted to replicate on the model. Uh, so I set about drawing a few of these bombs up using Tinkercad. Uh, Tinkercad's a free browser-based CAD package and is pretty much the limit of my 3D modelling knowledge, but it does make throwing something like these together super easy. The 3D models were then printed on my Anycubic Photon 3D printer using Elegoo ABS-like grey resin. These need to then be washed in alcohol before being post-cured under a UV light source. I um, commandeered my partner's UV nail light for this. All the bombs were painted up in exactly the same way as the rest of the interior. Once they were all painted up, I glued them in place with CA glue, taking care to position them where they can be seen through the open cargo door. I used a mask set from KV Models to mask all the clear parts. These were okay, but they are made from a very thick vinyl, which proved to be a tad difficult to remove later on in the build, but they did fit well and did the job. Once I was happy with the interior, I slotted it into place in the starboard fuselage half, which had already attached the tail section to. I then used some Humbrol poly cement to give a good strong join when attaching the other half. So, the fuselage seam, oh boy, I expected it to be quite difficult to remove but I did not expect to spend quite as much time on it as I did. I started with some squadron green putty and naively placed some masking tape down each side to protect the panel detail but it soon became apparent that it was just a waste of time. I then went through a few applications of CA glue, sanding everything back between each one and spraying a guide coat of black to check for issues. Three hours later. Yeah, I'm not even kidding, it took me three hours to get it to a point I was sort of vaguely happy with. Anyway, on to something slightly more fun. I attached all the wing halves together off camera along with the rudder, ailerons, horizontal stabilizers and elevators just to save you from the boredom. Uh, the wing struts were glued to the upper wings but the wings themselves were left loose for ease of painting. According to the instructions including with my chosen decals, this aircraft had an extended exhaust, so it was out with the Tinkercad again and I threw together a 3D print that amazingly fit first time.
And finally, that concludes the construction stage. See, we're only 15 minutes in. I told you I wouldn't go too in depth. As with the interior, I've primed the entire aircraft with gloss UNO black. I've pretty much moved over to the black basing method for my builds over the last few years. Uh, I know it's a bit of a marmite technique, but I personally find it a bit quicker and easier than your standard pre-shading, and it gives a pleasing effect to the paint. Once the aircraft is primed, the main colours are then mottled on top in a pretty random fashion. Looking at the one photo I can find of the aircraft I'm modelling, I think it started life in an overall plain grey livery, and then the various camouflage colours were quite roughly sprayed straight over the top of this once it was pressed into service. I decided to crack out my Iwata Neo for the camo itself for a change. My usual airbrush is a Harder and Steebeck Evolution, but that doesn't have a needle stop whereas the Iwata does. I wanted to spray the camo freehand so the needle stop just makes it a bit easier to avoid overspray and pooling while I'm spraying just a few millimetres away from the surface of the model. I tend to keep my air pressure moderately high when I'm doing freehand camo, perhaps counterintuitively, as I find it helps to avoid spitting. I use highly thin paint, probably around 60-70% to thinners, and almost kind of sketch in the colours very lightly and very close to the surface, building up the layers really slowly. This technique does take quite a while, uh, it took me the best part of an hour per colour, but I think the effect is well worth it.
preparation for decaling, I gave the entire model a good coat of gloss varnish. After spraying the camo, the surface was very matte, so I didn't want to risk applying the decal straight on top. A gloss coat just gives the decal a nice smooth surface to bed down onto and helps to avoid any silvering. I used a high decal set for the first time on the Colt. Uh, they're beautifully printed, but just ever so slightly on the thick side. Luckily there's only four decals, so it wasn't too much of an issue. I generally like to use Tamiya X20A acrylic thinner as a decal softening solution. I know a lot of people were asking after this on my last couple of videos. Surprisingly I find it to be about the most consistently effective decal softener out there. 9 times out of 10 it beds the decal down perfectly. Of course this time was the one time it didn't. After a bit of testing I finally found Mr Mark Softer from Mr Hobby eventually got the decals to settle. I then sealed all the decals under another good coat of gloss, ready for weathering. I've been using Flory Models clay washers for years and find they're practically idiot proof, which is fortunate. You can get similar effects using oil paints, but you just can't beat these washers for ease of use. You simply slot them all over your model, leave to dry completely, and then wipe off with a lightly moistened paper towel. Because I applied the wash over a glossy surface, a majority of it will come off on the paper towel. However, you could also do this over a matte or satin varnish if you want something a bit grubbier. At this point I always tend to seal in the wash with a matte coat just to avoid any more being removed in the subsequent weathering stages. I used one of these super handy circle templates to paint the engine. Uh, I first base coated it in black before lightly overspraying it with aluminium.
For the second weathering stage, I used a very heavily thin dark brown mixture. We're talking literally 90% thinness to paint. This was very lightly sprayed over panel lines, wing roots, anywhere that might accumulate dirt on the real aircraft. Because it's so thin, you can slowly build up the effect with more layers if you desire. If you want to create a more concentrated effect you can also mask off certain panels and spray around the edge with the same brown mixture to create a slightly more pronounced difference. After giving the exhaust a quick blast of heavily thin black, just to give it a slightly burnt oily appearance, I started to add some rust effects. Uh, I picked up these Wilder Aqualine weathering products after getting into Uncle Night Shift's videos earlier this year, and they rapidly became some of my favourite products. They're so easy to use and can be blended with tap water even once they're dry, in a very similar manner to oils and enamels. I generally start off with an overall wash of the lightest colour, followed by random splotches of the darker ones. These are then blended and can be moved around on the surface really easily. A quick blast with a hairdryer between coats means you can rapidly stack these colours on top of each other and make really convincing rust. Out with more of the Aqualine products now, uh, these two when used together make an incredibly convincing dry mud slash dust effect. I like to load up a medium sized brush and splatter these onto the model with a toothpick to give the impression of mud slung up by the wheels when landing or manoeuvring on a grassy airstrip. Again like the rust these look best when layered and can be easily adjusted with tap water or even completely removed if you're not happy with the effect.
picked out a few small parts with one of these Molotov chrome markers. I only picked this up a few months back but I have no idea how I managed so long without one. It makes doing really shiny chrome parts just an absolute breeze. My favourite method at the moment for doing subtle chipping along panel lines is using a Prismacolor silver pencil. Kept sharp, you can add some really fine convincing metal chips in a more controlled manner than you can with paint. This ideally needs to be done over a final matte coat, uh, and the matte coat really needs a good 24 hours or so to cure hard, otherwise the pencil will just scrape it away basically. You might have noticed quite early on in the build I managed to push through a couple of the side windows. I had thought about simply replacing these with some micro crystal clear PVA glue but figured I'd likely have to replace the whole lot to avoid them looking odd. Instead I bent a piece of brass tube to make a tool that I could use to carefully place the windows back in place from the inside. Easy said than done but it worked in the end. Eventually anyway. Once unmasked, the main canopy glasswork was glued in place with CA. Uh, this did leave a slight gap between the two halves, but I later filled this with some PVA glue.
So, on to the final bit, rigging. This was the bit of the build I've been dreading, but to be honest it went pretty smoothly. I used the easy line simply for ease of use. Uh, on the real aircraft the rigging is actually comprised of solid metal spars, so you could tackle this with some stretch sprue or even brass rod, but I didn't fancy having to do such precise cuts. Uh, easy line really does make it easy. You can simply tack one end in place with CA glue and stretch the other end to wherever it needs to be. I've got to be honest here, I was pretty chuffed with the way the ring turned out. There's little horizontal stiffening bars in the centre were added using a small length of brass tubing. I also gave the whole lot a quick blast with grey just to blend it into the rest of the airframe. And there we have it. This was a really enjoyable project for me. I've had this kit in my stash for a few years and I've been looking for a really interesting scheme to do it in. I think this one ticks that box. Thanks so much for tuning into this video and extra kudos for anyone who made it to the end. I hope you've enjoyed it. As usual, please do leave any suggestions for future videos in the comments and if you want to like and subscribe that will be brilliant. I've already started on the next video which is going to be something rather large, fast and European. Until then guys, take care.